What a blessing that is. Acts chapter 16 in your Bibles. I really think I I really think that sometimes we forget that that's what church is about. The fact that he gave himself for us. And then uh, I may read the verse in a little while about because he gave himself for us, we are to give our self for him. And um, it'd be a blessing if, if all of Christians and churches got that principle that he gave himself for us. He left glory in the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, left the riches of heaven to give us riches in heaven. And, uh, and just the sacrifice he made for us, and sometimes it's too much of a sacrifice for us to do something for him, but, um, but really we ought to. We ought to give ourselves a living sacrifice for him. Acts chapter 16, your Bibles, I, uh, I preached the last Sunday, and I don't play in these in, a, in an order, but looking back on them, I can see the order. And um, I preached last Sunday morning on the picture-perfect church and um, went through some things that the church is. A church is a, um, well, how Paul laid them out in Ephesians. He laid out the church as being a, a building, and then he said a body, and then he likened it to a bride. And I talked about the reason why all that's like that is because um, you get those, that illustration in it, a building, we're fitly framed together. You're here on purpose. You're framed together. You're connected to other people. And he says in that place, it becomes a habitation for God to, uh, for God to dwell in and His Spirit to dwell in there. It makes a habitation that's pleasing for Him and, and our prayer and our praise of Him. And then we talked about a body and the fact that we are, again, compacted together and we supply each other and then we go out and do something for um, the cause of Christ. We reveal Christ into this world as being a body. And then we talked about a bride where you learn to have a loving relationship with the Lord. You learn to love Him uh, and have that relationship with him. And he likened it to all those things. I talked about the picture perfect church is not a place that, well, it's got great pews and great parking lot and good air conditioning and, and colors that are nice on the wall and all those types of things. It is a place that is fitly framed together where it's a habitation. God can dwell in that place um, where it's a body that reveals, that reveals Christ in the community. And it's a place that you learn to love Christ and submit yourself to him. That's what, good, that's what good church is. That's what good church is producing. And then I preached on Sunday night about make full proof of thy ministry. Um, and the idea was, look, find, figuring out what God's given you to do within the body of Christ. And uh, I don't know if you realize that if you're saved, He's given gifts to men. That means all of you are sitting on a gift somewhere out there. But for the most part, what we do is we hide that gift and we don't use that gift and, um, and I promise you, there is a, there's somebody else within the body of Christ hurting because you're not using your, your part within the body of Christ. And, um, and because the gifts weren't given for you to highlight you. If, I, if I'm gifted at teaching, it is not so that people can say, what a, that's great, sign my Bible. It's, it is meant so that me can, so I can impart something to you to make you better. Um, and anything, songs that are sung, anything that's being done, it's not about us, it's about, it's about helping somebody else. Every gift was given to profit somebody else. In fact, he says it's there to profit with all, meaning with all means everybody else, not me. And, um, and so I talked about making, figuring out what your, what your spiritual gift is and then making full proof of it. Um, and I talked about on Sunday night, because some of you weren't here for that, and I said you would really hate it if I just threw something together. And, uh, and I put no effort into studying the Bible and put no effort into preaching it. Just got up here and just winged it and threw some stuff at you and then walked out and said, well, I checked the box. Eventually you would be thinking, I don't really think I want to be at that church. They don't feed me here. They, they, they serve me Happy Meals and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not getting any nourishment. Uh, well, the same thing would be true about any of your ministries. You got to put some effort into your ministries. Um, don't just show up, put some effort into it. Um, I, you know what I do? Let me say this. Show up. I do want you to show up. But I want you to show up and put some effort into what you're doing when you do it. And so you put all that together and you see Sunday morning and Sunday night that if a church, what a real church is, and then to even uh, help that with Sunday night with being like, all right, now I'm going to figure out how do I fit within this church. There's a church's purpose. I want to figure out my purpose within the church. 
And I want to, I want to find my spot. I'm going to start doing something that makes a difference. And now it brings you to this morning's message. And again, I didn't plan them that way. Looking back, I can see it. And it's making a difference. Being a Christian that makes a difference. You, as an individual, making a difference. Not as a church, not a ministry, but you as an individual that makes a difference. Acts chapter 16, your Bibles. This is Paul's on his second missionary journey. And I'm going to read through several verses and show you a few things and move through some of this uh, this morning. Hopefully it'll be a help to you. In chapter 16, in verse number 1, it says this, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, and believed. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decree for to keep uh, that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. That's from Acts chapter 15. They came up with a conclusion about some things. It was a controversy. They had a meeting together in Acts 15, came up with a conclusion, went into places and started delivering that conclusion to churches uh, about some of the things that they were having trouble with. In verse number 5, And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Well, this is great. I mean, you think about what Paul's doing here. He's moving through areas. They're they're rectifying problems. They're setting things in order the right way. Um, He's traveling through and, and finding a disciple, somebody that he can work with. And now he's going with him and he's working with discipling that young man who becomes a great leader. Uh, in his own right uh, later on. And he goes to churches. In verse number 5, you see that he's establishing them in the faith. And it's even increasing in number daily. I mean, churches are increasing. They're established. Disciples are being made. Now, there's some really good things happening uh, in the church at this time. And then it goes on to verse number 6. And now when they had come throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were bidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia... After they were come to Mycenae, they essayed or tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they passed by Mycenae and came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed to him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, I want you to, the, the first point I want to make about a person that makes a difference, a person that makes a difference. A different make a difference making kind of Christian is number one. We're making notes. Here's number one. They seek God's plan and direction in their life. They're seeking God's plan and direction in their life. There are some things that we might do in our life. We might be saying, God, what would you have me to do? And God may say, I don't want you to do this thing over here. I've, I've got this over here I want you to do. And maybe we need to maybe get to the place we start asking what God wants for our life. Amen to that? You can ask God what God wants for my life. Not just what I want to do with my life and where I want to go and what I want to do. Maybe taking the time to ask God, God, what would you have me to do? A difference-making type of uh, a Christian is somebody that's not just living for doing what I want, but is, is trying to at least seek God's direction for what God wants in their life. They're asking, they're, they're seeking, what do you want? And God would say, hey, not over here, and, and not over here, but I've got something over here that I'm wanting you to do. And, and just seeking God and asking God for your life. I know it's a novel idea, but it's just a matter of maybe praying and asking God for every area of your life. And asking God, what do you want? I mean, I think a, a difference maker, if you're going to make a difference, you can't just co- coast down the river of life hoping that you're going to bump into making a difference in somebody's life. It's going to have to be on purpose. You're going to have to have a, I know they, they wrote a book and people have different ideas about it. You're going to have to have a, a life that has a purpose, a purpose-driven life. You've got to have a life that has a purpose to where you're going in life. You're doing things on purpose, not on accident. And asking God, God, what, what, do you, what do you want me to do? I've been thinking about this. I've got a little notebook I started keeping now, and, and I'm writing down, God, I, I did this. I said, God, what is the purpose for the church? Maybe this is where this message is coming from. God, what is your purpose for the church? All right, then God, what is the purpose? How, do, how does our church fit into the purpose of the church? And then I, 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 the next question I've got written down is, how do, what is my purpose within the church? 
How do I fit within the plan that you've got that you're trying to do in the world? How is our church fitting within the plan you're trying to do in the world? How do I fit within this church and how does it fit within the plan? How is this all work together? Because I don't want to get to the end of my life and say, I just lived a life and floated down the river. I want to figure out what did God have for me to do within the purpose and the plan of God? What does God have for you to do? What, what impact are you making in life? You say, well, I'm, I'm this age or I'm that age. I don't care what age you're at or what walk you're at in your life. You ought to at least stop and start asking God now, God, what is my purpose? What do you want me to do within the body? And it may be that you say, well, is it this? And he might say, no, it's not, it's not here. They're, they're traveling through on this journey and they, they hit where, where Asia is at there and that Ephesus and those things are down there. And they start to come up and they get ready to go into Asia and they're making that loop in there. And as they go in there, the Lord says, no, don't go there. Wait, wait a minute, God, is that because those people over there don't, don't get salvation? No, it's just not time right now for you to go there. They were at least sensitive enough to ask God and seek God for direction in their life. No, no, it's not time to go there. They said, okay, so they went up a little bit, and then Bithynia, that area is right up above them. And they said, okay, well, this must be the direction to go. And God says, nope, can't go there. They tried to go. He said, nope, can't go there. So, well, where do we go? Well, the next place we can go is the Troas, and we'll move on towards Troas. And God says, bingo, you're on the right track now. And then got them in a boat, got them going over into Macedonia, and they go over there and reach a bunch of people in Macedonia. I'm just saying to you, first point, very easy, is a person that makes a difference, that makes a difference in the world is a person that is seeking God's plan and God's direction for their life. Have you ever asked God, God, what do you, what do you want me to do? Let me ask you a question. If God gave you direction, would you do it? I mean, no sense in asking if you're not going to do it. You say, well, how am I going to get the direction? Do I have to, is it a dream? Do I have a dream? And then, I, let me tell you this. I wouldn't trust, I, I, I would trust what the Bible says that God did for Paul. I believe that was true. I would say, I would be leery of you trusting your dreams for the directions for your life. I think there's, there's some clear ways that we've got, now that we've got a Bible sitting in our hands, we have the Holy Spirit in our life. I think there's some clear ways we can do that that are a little more sure. And I would say this, if you were in, in Brother Aaron Bibb's Sunday School class, you heard this this morning, but you've got clear scriptures that give you clear guidance about what to do with your life. You've got scriptures. You've got the Spirit of God that will always bear witness of what the Scriptures always say. And you've got Spirit-filled people around you in your life. You can ask directions. In a multitude of counselors, there is safety. And then you've got sermons that are preached that will be, if they're preaching what God's Word says, it may give you some insight into what God wants. And then you may have situations He puts in your life. And I wouldn't say, well, I, I heard a sermon, so I'll just change my entire life because the guy said uh, something about, he used the word west in there, so I need to pick up and move to the west. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I've known people that said, I'm, I'm God, give me a, a new car. What should I have for a car? And they open their Bible and it says, dwell together in one accord. They said, i got to get a Honda. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about clear guidance from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and spiritual people around you. And God can direct the path of your life. But what I'm asking you is, are you at least asking God for direction? Are you seeking? Difference makers are people that are seeking God's direction for their life. And in verse number 10, watch what it says. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia assuredly gathering, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So he's feeling pretty assured in verse 10 and 11. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Salmathacia and the next day to Neapolis. And they, they go there, it's by boat. They're going there with a ship or a boat. They're going across. In verse number 12, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony, and were in that city abiding certain days. In verse number 13, it says, and on the Sabbath, we went out in the city by the riverside. Remember, they always went to the Jews first, anywhere they went. And so it would be a Sabbath day going to the Jews first and then going to the, to the Gentiles after that. But they'd go to the Jews. They found a Sabbath. They found where some of them were at. And it says they were praying where prayer was wont to be made. They were making prayer there. And we sat down and spake unto the women 
which resorted thither. Now, now think about this. I'm, I've asked God. God said no to this. God said no to that. But God gave me some clear direction about this. And I, and I, I gather assuredly, I feel assured that God is moving in my life in this direction. It's important when you think about it. And as I go there, I find some confirmation. There's some people that are there that are resorting thither and they're praying and I have an audience with them. I'm able to to talk with them. Look at verse number 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, she believed and then she was baptized and her household, she besought us saying, if Ye had judged me to be faithful to the Lord. Come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And let me say something to you. Uh, This is the foundation of the church at Philippi. And when you get to verse number 40, when they get out of prison, this is where they go back to to strengthen the brethren. It's in the house that is at Lydia's house. That's where they do it. Now, let me tell you, there's some pretty good confirmation going on here. I ask God, God, do you want me to go here? Nope. Do you want me to do this? Nope. But God directs me into a path. And when I get there, I find all the things I was looking for. I've got some confirmation about the things that God has for my life. Sounds like things are going pretty good, don't it? Wouldn't it be good if everything you prayed about God said, nope to this, no to this, go this way. You went there and everything was wonderful. Let me say amen to that. I'd be great, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be fantastic? All right, well, let's keep reading them. Look at verse 16. And it came to pass. It always happens. It always happens. It comes to pass. Came to pass. As we went to prayer, we're doing good. A certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us show unto us the way of salvation. That sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty good. The problem is she's not saying it like, Hey, everybody, come here and get saved. She's actually trying to stir up a problem through this, whatever this demon that's in her, stir up a problem and cause them to get beaten and thrown out of the city like they have been in other places. And verse 18, and this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her the same hour. Boy, it sounds pretty good. So this is what I'm going to say to you. You can be a, a difference maker by seeking the will of God for your life. But, but watch the second point. Here it is. You're making notes. You'll become a difference maker by sticking with the plan of God for your life. Even when things get difficult. They hit some spiritual attack. I can promise you this. I I may make a promise to you. If you do anything for God, you try to do anything for God, you will come under an attack. You say, well, let's just don't do anything for God. Sure, you can do it that way. You can do it that way. Satan's already won if you do it that way. Let me say that again so maybe you can get it. Satan's already won if you just do nothing. If he can get every Christian to do absolutely nothing in life... That's pretty success. That's pretty successful. <clears throat> but here we are, we're moving along, we're seeking God, we're seeing progress, and now we have spiritual opposition. Verse number 19, And when her master saw the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Now, that's a problem. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrate rent off their clothes. I don't mean the magistrate said, I'm going to get naked. It means that they took their clothes off. They they brought them in, Paul and them, and, and took their clothes off and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the the jailer to keep them safe. Whoever received such a charge thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. Let me make a statement. The first one is this. Difference makers seek God's plan and direction for their life. But let me say this. Difference makers stick with God's plan and direction for their life. Because it's about this time that if it was me, I would have been like, you know what? That's why I don't trust dreams. That's what I would have said. <laughs> it's about this time I would have been like, I knew I shouldn't have trusted a dream. I might have said, guys, we never should have ate pizza before we went to bed. 
I'm having weird dreams at night. Now we end up in prison. Uh, That's what you do. I promise you that's what you do. What you do is you start second guessing what God showed you in the light. When you get in darkness, you start saying, I don't know if I believe any of that anymore. Difference makers stick with the plan. Listen, if all Satan ever has to do is to just give you a little bit of shaking and you back up from the plan, all the stuff you were planning on doing for God that was going to be good, it all goes to waste. This is when people begin to, to question, how am I really following God? Am I really listening to God? This is the place, listen to this close to this, this is the place that all of your buddies and the churches down the street and all your friends have begun to say, I knew you probably shouldn't have trusted that advice or that scripture or whatever. This is when they start questioning your decisions. You'll find people that as you're going through the plan of God, and they say, well, I, I knew it. I knew you should have went to Bithynia. If you went to Bithynia, you never would have had this problem. Yeah, but God told me not to go to Bithynia. Yeah, but I, I, just, I think maybe you misheard that. This is when your friends will start to throw a little bit of shade on any decision you've been trying to make. This is when you start to question it. Can I tell you something? I want you to get this. You know the rest of the story for the most part. Most of you know. There's a jailer. There's a man at that jail that's going to get saved in a few minutes. And a whole house is going to be changed in a few minutes. And sometimes we look at things and think that's a difficulty And that difficulty means I'm on the wrong track. That difficulty might tell you you're right on the money. When the disciples got in the boat, remember, and the Lord said, we're going to the other side, remember that? And they got in the boat and there was a big storm and they're all in the storm trying to figure out what to do and they're having this difficulty. Remember that? Remember the story? Remember they got through it? What was on the other side? One maniac, actually two maniacs on the other side in a in a cave, and it was, he went over there, he healed that man, that man got everything right, he was in his right mind, nobody else could help him, he went over there, he took care of that one man, and if anybody said, well, was it worth it to go through all that storm to get to the other side, somebody might say, I don't know if it was worth it, I promise you this, that one man would have said, I'm thankful he came over to the other side for me. Sometimes we go through storms and we think, let's just quit, let's just back up, let's just stop whatever we're doing, and we miss out on the great thing God's got just ahead if we would just keep going forward for God. In Acts chapter 8, Philip is called into a desert place, leaves a revival to go into a desert place to sit in the desert. Did I hear God right? I don't know if I heard God right. I left the revival meeting, Acts 8, to go into a desert and to sit in a desert. This makes no sense. Does it make any sense to you? It makes no sense to me. I mean, great things are going. I'm going to go sit in a place by myself. It makes no sense. This makes no sense, God. And after a while, for most of us, we'd be going, God, nothing's happening. I've been here for a little while. And you know what most of us would do? We'd quit. We would question Did I hear it right? But then here comes a chariot. And there's there's an Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot riding along. And just so happens, the guy is reading Isaiah. Isn't that crazy? And and, and he, he sits there and the guy stops and he goes over and joins himself to the man. And the guy is reading and he says, you understand what that read is? You know, this is crazy to think that God told you, gave you direction, and everybody else may think you're, ex- you're nuts, and you're sitting there, and you're even starting to think, I'm a little bit nuts because I'm sitting out here. And then, lo and behold, here comes the exact person God wanted you. It would almost be as if God was doing it, wouldn't it? Isn't that, isn't that crazy to think that way? And he jumps up in the chariot and leads that guy to the Lord, and that guy gets saved. I'm just telling you that not everything's going to work out like... I mean, hey, the first half of this story, we're seeing churches strengthened, we're finding disciples, uh, it, we're, we're, God's given us clear direction, and we're going here, and we're going there, and we get to find a boat, we go over, and we're finding people. Can you imagine, I'm going to start a church, and you show up, and there's people already sitting there praying, you're like, well, let's just talk to them. They talk to them, one of them says, hey, I've got a big house, you want to come, you want to come, come to my house, and, and I'll get saved, my whole house gets saved, and we'll start the church out of my house, and I'll fund it. You're like, man, this is great. Until somebody from the city says, we don't like this, you don't have a permit for this, in fact, we want to put you in prison for what you're doing. Then you start questioning everything. 
And your friends start questioning. Let me give you a third point about difference makers. If you're going to make a difference, this is important. Number one, they seek God's plan and direction. Two, they stick with God's plan and direction. Three, they sing God's praises in difficulty. Because when you look at verse number 24, they're in the inner prison, feet fast in the stocks. Verse 25, great verse. This rolls off the tongue as you read it. It's, it I, I say this all the time. There's a lot of things that the Bible says and that we preach that is, it feels different to live out. Verse number 25, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. <clears throat> and the prisoners, what? Everybody's listening to what you're doing in the midst of your difficulty. The prisoners heard it. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Difference makers sing God's praises in the midst of difficulty. And let me tell you something. They don't sing God's praises because they're happy that they just got beaten and it feels good. They're singing God's praises because they trust Him in the midst of all that's going on. You may remember the verse in Philippians 4, 6, Be careful for nothing, full of care for nothing, but in everything. Say it with me. I'm going to say it again. In what? Let's do it again. There's about 50% of you. In what? Say it. Everything. I know that you don't, nobody likes that, but that's, that's what it says. By prayer and supplication with, this one's hard, thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. The next verse she was helping us with it. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know what? You know what we want? Listen real close. I'm not, there's not a whole lot left of this. I want the peace in the midst of my difficulties. How many of you want peace in the midst of your difficulties? All right, but what does it say you have to do first? Don't be full of care. You know peace in being full of care. What you have to be is careful for nothing but in everything you got to pray supplication asking for the supply mixed with what thanksgiving say well i just don't find anything to be thankful for well there's a lot of things that we go through in life and i know some of you are going through them right now i've got a prayer list praying for some of y'all's issues that are i mean heart-wrenching issues there are some things that i can be thankful for in the midst of some real difficult things i can be thankful i got a god in heaven and I can be thankful that whenever I have someone that passes away, I'll see them again in Christ. There's some things that I can find something to thank God for in the midst of some really difficult things sometimes. It's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying the peace only comes after that. Let me ask you a question. This is a good one. What if God's waiting for you to start trusting and praising Him before He starts giving you peace about the thing you're in? What if you're looking for direction in your life? What if you're, somebody said this to me just the other day, and I can't remember the exact circumstances, but they were talking to me about, uh, I think it was about a job. And uh, I do remember some more of it. And, uh, and we were talking about a job, and they were saying they were, they were worried about some things with it. And their wife said, well, why don't you just trust God? And when they finally got to the point where they said, well, I'll just trust God about it, the next day the thing happened. What if God was holding off, just waiting for you to start trusting Him, before he gave you the answer you've been asking for. I know a couple of you, some of you grumbled and some of you said, "Uh uh-huh. And I I know that's easier said than done. But what they did is they sang praises in the middle of this. Richard Wormbrandt, I don't know if you might know who that is, but he was a a Romanian Christian minister. and, um, And this was back in 1948. He said that the communism... Uh, and Christianity were not compatible and was placed in prison. This is what he says. It was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of, of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching, so we accepted their terms, the communist terms. He says, it was a deal. We preached and they beat us. 
We were happy preaching. They were happy beating us. Everyone was happy. That's, that's crazy to think like that. But he went on to say this. There are two kinds of Christians. Those who sincerely believe in God and those who just as sincerely believe that they believe. He said you can tell them apart by their actions in difficult moments. There's a song that I like. Somebody sang it one time and I've, I've heard it and I've loved it ever since. There's a song that says I can still sing it now. And I forget that the Clark family sings it. And it says this, this is what it says. Well, I have sung Amazing Grace since I was just a child, and I've joined in on it's, it as well at least a thousand times. And singing Jesus Loves Me is a precious memory. I remember when, just as I am, first brought me to my knees. Oh, but here I am surrounded by some things I can't explain. But the truth is still the truth in the moments that my heart breaks. And if I could sing it then, I can sing it now. Watch this now, because who he was is who he is, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I might be standing in the darkness with trouble all around, but if I could sing it then, I can still sing it now. He go, it goes on to say this, Oh, it's not always easy to join those melodies, but how sweetly they remind me of what I still believe. And this is what it says, A voice that's raised in times like these may be the truest praise. Because I've never been forsaken, and that will never change. That's a great song when you think about it. And I, that one line has always stuck out to me. The true, it's easy to praise God when you're sitting in a room and everybody's happy and everything's going well. It's different to praise God in the midst of troubles. But I promise you, just like it said right here, the prisoners heard them. People are listening to what we do in the midst of our trials. A difference maker sings God's praises in difficulty. And the fourth one is this. Look down at verse number 27. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword. Now get the picture in your mind. The, the, the doors open, earthquake, and they're getting ready to take off. I mean, God's moving in. Revival's happened in the jailhouse. They've been singing praises. God hears it. The people hear it. God brings an earthquake. The foundation of the prison are shaken. The doors are open. Everybody's getting ready to go, and the bands are loose off all the people, and they're getting ready to take off, and the prisoner awakes and sees it and realizes he's going to get overrun. It's going to be a problem. Pulls out his sword, and he's going to kill himself. He said he would have killed himself. Supposing the prisoners had been fled. Now let me tell you something. This is a guy that just got through beating you, cussing you probably. Didn't just throw you in prison, he threw you in the inner part of the prison. And it wasn't enough that I beat you and your back's bleeding and your head's bleeding and you're, and you're filthy and foul from all this stuff and you ain't got any clothes on. I, I had to throw you in the inner prison and then put your feet in stocks so that you are now you can't even move. Now, how many of you, when everything came loose, would have felt a little bit irritated with that guy? That guy? Now, some of you are better Christians than me, so you won't raise your hand. <laughs> I'd have felt a little bit irritated with it. I'm like, hey, man, you need some help? You know, you're going to kill yourself. Have at it, dude. I'm out of here. You get what you deserve. I mean, you might feel that way, right? I know I'm not the only one. You might feel that way. But that's not what they did, though. I'm not talking about being a difference maker. If you're going to be a difference maker, you've got to be different. And here, here's what he did. He would have killed himself because they thought he fled. Verse number 28, but Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Your fourth point is this. Difference makers show the mercy and the kindness of God. Difference makers show the mercy and the kindness of God. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You realize that made a difference in that man's life for eternity? How you handle things and what you show people when it comes to mercy, it changes people's lives for eternity? Sometimes we respond to things the way the flesh wants us to respond instead of the way the Spirit wants us to respond. We miss an opportunity. Can you imagine how it, things might have gone if instead of responding in anger, we responded with mercy? I, was, I said this to everybody the other day, 
in the, the, the um, visitation time, and uh, I was driving to Subway to get a sandwich. And uh, I like Jersey Mike's better, but Subway was closer, so I just went to Subway. Because I was in a hurry because I'm, you know, I don't want to, I'm not patient. I don't want to wait. I didn't want to drive an extra little bit of, of distance to wait. So I went to Subway. And I came around the corner of Subway on the back side of it, and there was two guys walking across the, the driveway there. And they had parked over here, and they're walking across. And they were walking, I'm pulling this way, and they're walking, and they see me. Right, they're walking, kind of like talking to each other. They see me, and, and no lie, they slowed down and started walking slower. And they're just staring at me like, what are you going to do about it? That kind of look. You know, and I was a big truck. I thought it would just, just brrr, it'd be over. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be no problem. But I thought, they're just looking at me like. And they, they looked at each other, said a few things, looked back at me, and just slowly walked. It was an older guy and a younger guy. And I, and I kind of felt like I was, I was irritated. I know you're thinking, you know, that's not, you shouldn't be that way. I know, I know that. You don't have to tell me, I know. Stop judging me. I, I, was, I was feeling a little bit, but I was, I was irritated. And I was thinking, just get out of the way. And, and I, was, I was irritated. And I, no lie, I pulled up a parking spot, and they went in, and I felt, like, I felt like the Holy Spirit just said, why are you mad at them? Why don't you give them a gospel track? And I was like, ah, you're right. So I got... I got some gospel tracks, and I went in. Well, they went to the, go clean their hands first, and I went and got in line, so I didn't see them. And then they walked back up, and I thought, all right, well, let me, let me try to talk to them. So, uh, you know, what am I going to say? You know, hey, why'd you walk so slow when you were coming? Right? <laughs> I just looked at them. I was like, hey, what y'all doing today? And they were like, oh, we're working out, outside. And I was like, oh, man, I would hate to be working outside today. It's just, this is terrible weather to be working outside. So, yeah, we're moving rocks from one pile to another pile. I was like, oh, man, I, I hate it that you're having to do that. It is so hot. These guys like, yeah. I said, are you drinking plenty of water? Are you getting, getting something to drink? He said, yeah. He said, we're eating lots of fruit and drinking lots of water. It's just really, really tough. And I said, man, I'm sorry. I, I hate that you have to go through that kind of, you know, working like this. And uh, the other guy walked up. And as he's walking up, I'm, I'm talking to this guy. And I said, well, I pastor the church right up the road up here, Victory Baptist Church. Can I give you a gospel track? And the guy's like, sure. And he, he takes it. And, um, and as I'm telling him Victory Baptist Church, the other guy came around the corner and the guy's wearing a shirt that says Victory Landscaping. And so I was like, Victory Landscaping? He says, yeah, I said it from Victory Baptist Church. And so we started talking, and he's like, well, I'm a deacon at this church somewhere, whatever, whatever. And I said, all right, well, praise the Lord. So, so we got to talking a little about the Lord, and, and that it turned out to be a really great little experience going through. We went through and, and, uh, and got the food. And I came back to Subway again a few days later, and there's that gentleman sitting with his Victory stuff sitting at the table, and now he walked in, and I walked up, and we fist bumped, and I went and got my stuff, and I've, I'm growing a little bit, because remember before, people fist bump, I was trying to shake their fist, and so now I'm like, shake, I'm fist bump, I fist bump, and I'm walking, and I made a new friend, listen, that could have went a whole different direction, I could have went a whole different direction if I didn't take the opportunity to show kindness and mercy and care and compassion instead of what my flesh wanted to do in that moment. You see the difference? Difference makers are different. They show mercy and kindness. And then can I tell you what happened? Difference makers make a difference and that difference spreads to other people. Look at verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. You know what came to the house? That same word came to his, this man's house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. That's what, think about it for a minute. This man who was just shown kindness is now showing them kindness. The man that was beating them psh, psh, is now laying them down and cleaning the stripes that he laid on them. He's showing kindness. It has a way, kindness has a way of of spreading. And look at verse number 34, the last thing I'm going to say. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. They worshiped together. Brought the word in, the washing and cleaning and, and worshiping. That same group that was singing in the midst of... Diff Listen now, this is so good. They were singing in difficulty. It made a difference in that man's life. You know what they brought into that house? That same rejoicing ended up in that person's house. 
it has a way of spreading. Difference makers have a way of making difference and making a difference in other people's homes and lives. I, I'm, I'm glad we have, I feel like we have a church that's trying to be what it needs to be. I, I'm glad about that one. I'm glad we have people that are trying to figure out what their gift is and making full proof of their ministry. I'm glad about that. But you know what else I want to, I want to get to the end of this journey and realize that I've made a difference in somebody's life. And I don't, I don't, that shouldn't be just the goal of the pastor. That should be a goal of every person everywhere that's a Christian. And, and each one of us can do that in our own way. Make a difference. If you're not saved this morning, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, then I would say to this, the first thing you have got to do is you've got to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone to save you from your sins and be your Lord and Savior. That's the first step. I mean, nothing, nothing, none of this other stuff matters until you first do that. So if you haven't done that, you need to do that. And then if you're saved this morning, I would, I would encourage you to do this. Ask God this morning. Seek God's plan and direction for your life. What is my purpose and what do you have for me to do? And what, how do I fulfill that? And then when you hit a difficulty, because I promise you you will, don't quit on God. Don't quit on doing something for God. You just keep going with God and watch what God will do. Let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> She's going to come play for us just a minute after I pray, and it'll, it'll, the invitation time will be open. Uh, we won't, it won't draw out for a long time. It'll just be a time where you can come to an altar and pray, talk to God about whatever you've got on your heart. You can do it at your seat. Um, but, but spend that time. Spend that time talking to God a little bit this morning. Lord, we love you. We ask you to please bless in the lives of these people. Help them. Lord, help us through your power, through your guidance, through your word, through obedience to it. Help us to be a difference maker in people's lives, and the people you, you interject into our lives, that you interject us into their lives. Help us to be difference makers. Help us be different than our flesh and make a difference in people's lives. Help this church to do that in this community, but help us as individuals do it. Father, we love you. Thank you for making a difference in our life. Thank you for giving yourself on the cross to die for our sins and giving us an example of sacri- what sacrifice looks like. Help us to live that out. Father, bless and do the work that really only you can do now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's some praying. Why don't you come pray? Why don't you pray at your seat or come to an altar and pray? But just talk to the Lord for a few minutes this morning. Ask God, what, what do you want for my life, Lord?